All right. So next, we're going to have up our associate dean for research um, and senior professor of practice, Richard Campanella. Okay. Thank you. Um, good to see you all. Um, I'm going to try to make the case uh, for why New Orleans, and I'm going to do so not so uh, not so much as an architect because I'm not one, but as a geographer and looking at the emergence of the built environment here. Um, and I'm going to start out with one of my favorite aerial photos I've ever found of the city. I discovered it in the 1990s in the Army Corps of Engineers archives. It was taken around 1950. And for those of you who are familiar with the metropolis here, it might take a while for you to orient yourself. Uh, you are over Lake Pontchartrain, looking toward the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the North American lithosphere is behind you, okay? So you're quite literally on the edges of the continent on this alluvial mud flat spilled out rather recently uh, at the continental edge. And what I love about it is uh, that sense of precarity that you have here. You could really get a sense of what it means to be perched on, on the, the edge of a continent. Uh, and you have here both the straight lines and the 90 degree angles to which human designers are predisposed, uh, but prevailing are the sinuous, curvaceous geographies that, that nature uh, presents us. And so what I see in this photo is that, that constant centuries old experimentation, innovation, negotiation of the built environment upon this very precarious underlying physical environment. As you look toward the top here, you're looking south and with that backlighting and that mist and that this plumes of smoke going up, you can get a sense that this deltaic plane starts to fray out to the Gulf of Mexico and to world oceans there. Again, in, in, in imbuing that sense of a little bit of risk, of growing risk, uh, but, but also of, of beauty and a sense of almost epic excitement to be here. And it's that, that duality of precarity and beauty, that paradox that you see playing out in everyday life here. Uh, you could find examples of human triumph and human tragedy here. Uh, and all of the above, I think, makes this uh, a really um, amazing place to stretch your intellectual legs. Uh, and so I will kind of make that case again as a geographer and take you back um, to understand where this risk comes from. Uh, and so a society that lives with, with risk where you can design to reduce it, you're not going to eliminate it. OK, uh, we don't even use the terms uh, levy protection system anymore. You know what it's called now? The risk reduction system. OK, and it took a lot of grappling and learning and um, and uh, using words to express what would really the limits of what humans could do to recognize that we could only reduce risk. And I would put at the top of the list. Um, architects as well as engineers and, and geographers, architects de designing to reduce risk and, and others uh, looking for the best spaces of where we should and perhaps should not be uh, living. So to understand the origin of the, this risk, you have to under, understand the unusual, uh, distinctive physical origins of our environment here. Uh, and I'm going to start out, Inyaki mentioned earlier that, that we don't do well with water. Uh, and indeed, we don't. We are a species that evolved in a hard, interior, continental environment. We like sol solidified earth and rigid geography beneath our feet. But our economic systems, the way we move around in the world, drive us, drive us towards ports and rivers and riverine and, and coastal environments. Uh, and so the set of skills that one would develop uh, in, in an alluvial fluvial delta like this are really quite portable worldwide. So let me explain how this area formed here. Uh, and you might be surprised to hear that uh, everywhere, just look at through 360 around, the underlying physical environment here is a product of a warming global climate. Um, and as much as, as that is a threat in the decades and centuries ahead, uh, we, the sediment arrived here because as those ice sheets started to melt after glacial maximum 18 to 20,000 years ago, uh, 
uh, in in uh, very erratic uh, increments, uh, natural uh, global cycles, that ice sheet uh, receded, melted, uh, and as it did, as it receded, it unveiled kind of this newly resculpted North American topography and hydrology. And now you have massively augmented amounts of water coming down the Ohio River, which by the way, is the source of most of the water that you see here in the Mississippi. Uh, the upper Mississippi tributaries to the west, most of our sediment comes from the Missouri as well as the, uh, the Arkansas and the Red River, uh, to the point that they started uh, filling in this indentation in the Earth's crust was known as the Mississippi Embayment. You go back tens of millions of years, salt water came in all the way up to Southern Illinois, okay? Uh, and so now that indentation, all of this sediment laden, increased water from the melted ice starts to fill in the embayment and it becomes the lower Mississippi Valley. So now let's zoom in on here. Sea levels are now rising because the ice sheets are melting. And you might be surprised to see that eight to 10,000 years ago, the Gulf of Mexico, we, we would be in Gulf waters right here. And you'd have to go across Lake Pontchartrain uh, to the Pleistocene Terrace, the older terrain across the lake, uh, to be on the, the, the bite, uh, B-I-G-H-T bite of the, of the Gulf of Mexico. So here, let, let me just orient you here because it's an oblique view. Uh, here's uh, Illa, Southern Illinois, here's the Ozarks in, um, in uh, Arkansas on the upper left. Uh, and so you ha now have this conveyor belt of water, sand, silt, and clay coming down here and uh, discharging into a relatively placid water body. Uh, now, when we have hurricanes, it's perfectly turbid, but uh, it is a gulf of a sea of an ocean. Yes, we do have tides, but they're only about 14 to 18 inches. Uh, yes, we do have currents, but they're not particularly strong. Meanwhile, what's coming down here is the largest river uh, on the continent. Uh, and during uh, high water, it's upwards of a million cubic feet per second with lots of, of uh, 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 clay and silt uh, particles in the water column and loads of, of sand uh, in, in the bed load. And so as it discharges into the Gulf of Mexico, all of that sediment starts to pile up uh, at the bottom of the uh, water and eventually rises, breaks the, uh, the water surface, it becomes a saline marsh, more sediment comes down, it starts to become a freshwater marsh and then actual land to the point that the river could no longer go through its own deposition. And so water is lazy. Moving water wants the path of least resistance. It'll find a quicker, shorter route to its destination and lunge in a whole new direction. So these are called avulsion events, the river channel radically jumping in a new direction. And this is the one, it's about 4,000 years ago, that came eastward and started starting depositing sediment in the area where you are now. So what's extraordinary about this, um, most rivers have some sort of uh, sediment, but where they discharge into the sea, the sea usually wins the battle. The tidal regime, the daily tidal regime sweeps most of that sediment away. Strong currents like in the North Sea uh, win the battle and, and the delta that forms only slightly protrudes uh, into the receiving water body. But here, the river wins the battle. In fact, the term for the delta that you're about to see created here is exactly that. It's a river dominated delta, also known as a fluvial delta, as opposed to a tide dominated or a wave dominated delta, which are most other world deltas. Uh, and so more of more of this sediment is coming down at a pace faster than the sea could sweep it away. And everything I just described over a period of only 5,000 years for New Orleans proper and only 7,000 years for Southeastern Louisiana shifted from this to this. So when you see this, that's a little bit more of a familiar morphology to uh, uh, when you look at the map of the United States today. Uh, but all of this is that very recently deposited and very, so this is five to 7,000 years old, right across the lake, you see those bluffs and terraces, that's 2 million years old. Uh, and so this fluvial delta 
uh, once again represents that natural fluidity and dynamism to which humans uh, are poorly involved and evolved. And so that is why uh, the architecture and the engineering and our ability to, uh, to uh, uh, live with this sort of dynamism uh, in a way that makes it sustainable. Um, and so up until the uh, arrival of, um, of, of uh, a colonial interest here just over 300 years ago, even though this river only jumped channels about once every thousand years, what it did every three to five years was overtop its banks with high water and send a sheet back, uh, back further away from the river, all depositing all the more sediment. So the river is to your left right now, uh, about little under a mile. So just imagine under historical conditions, this would have been dense forest here. It would have been hydric soils. It would not have been swamp here. The swamp would have been further back over there. The high ground was closest to the river. Now, if that sounds strange, you think of most other terrestrial environments, water carves down, not in a delta like this one here, because the sediment arrived thanks to the river. As the river overtopped, the heaviest sediments dropped out immediately uh, in the largest quantities, and lighter sediments dropped out in smaller quantities further back. So with each flood cycle, the areas closest to the river rise uh, rise higher and higher, um, to eight feet, to 10 feet, to 12 feet. Now, when you're a New Orleans ge geographer, you almost hold your breath at the sheer height of eight to 10 to 12 feet, okay? Uh, and the rest of the country, that might be, uh, you know, the lowest place around. But um, because for the first 200 years of the city's history, uh, we didn't have the engineering technology for, to drain the back swamps, most urbanization was limited to the high ground closer to the river. You're on it right now. You're actually on the back slope of this phenomenon, which is called a natural levee, levee to raise up, uh, natural as opposed to the artificial levees, which is what colonials as early as 7, 1719, one year after the city was first founded, we had our first river flood. Uh, and so through French and then Spanish colonial times into the American era, clear up to today, was this uh, intervention to uh, impose rigidity on this underlying fluidity to prevent what we call flooding. No other species thinks of this as flooding. Uh, rivers, uh, when rivers exceed their banks, they store water laterally. Uh, other species move away from it and they adapt to it. We problematize this for perfectly understandable reasons and you would not be here today if we did not. But here's the paradox. We have undermined our geography here because of the very interventions that allowed us to build a city here. And that is what we have to figure out a way to balance. So what I'm referring to is the erection of artificial levees at the crest of each of those natural levees. This got off to a tenuous start. They failed constantly throughout the 19th century. We had what were called crevasse floods. Uh, but by, by the mid 20th century, we Army Corps of Engineers pretty much mastered the system of building very strong earthen embankments to uh, lock the river in a straitjacket. okay? So it could no longer jump around. New Orleans would be big trouble if it did. Uh, and it, for the most part, could no longer overtop its levees. All good for urbanization and having a society here. But what this also did was that instead of allowing all these two, you know, the, 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 the two vital uh, elements that fluvial deltas constantly need, new fresh water to push back the salt water and new sediment to keep it above sea level. We are now ejecting most of that uselessly onto the continental shelf. The rest of it comes down uh, the Atchafalaya for very complicated reasons we could talk about another time. And so we're really no longer depositing to our Delta egg bank account. Uh, worse yet, we're withdrawing more and more from our Delta egg bank account. And we're doing so because you, have, you do have some uh, uh, currents here that are eating away at it, uh, but more so uh, with sea level rise and other manipulations here, we have invited the rising sea closer and closer, even as we're no longer pushing it back with new fresh water and sediments. Uh, how are we doing this? Well, this is a port city. That was its original uh, impetus. 
and ports uh, right up till today compete with other ports. Uh, they want to convince world shipping that you could get faster, better, cheaper to your destination by making a call at this port. And what that led to by the early 20th century was what one historian called the Seaway Movement, where American ports and elsewhere were racing to render their natural geographical advantages of the river or whatever environment they might have by digging seaways, by digging artificial uh, canals to get ships straighter in. This coincided with the era of containerization, which also had the effect of shifting ports. Uh, and so over the course of the 1920s through 1940s, uh, the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway was cut through. Over the course of the 1960s, the MRGO Canal was cut through over here and myriad other smaller uh, canals uh, in uh, over to the west. Worse yet, at the same time, Louisiana started developing a petroleum industry starting in 1901 and extracted enormous riches from this, which have benefited the state, but it came at a terrible cost. Uh, and they are myriad, but I'll just focus on one here. If you make uh, an oil discovery out in a marsh to get the derrick there, you can't build a road, okay? You have to float the derrick there. Well, you can't float it through a marsh and let you, unless you scour away a canal through the marsh. And so Louisiana permitted uh, about 10,000 miles of these oil and gas extraction canals. And you, if you look at a satellite image of this area, once again, you see this network of straight lines. Uh, the, uh, the, the canal was scoured out, the derrick was put in, the oil was extracted, it was pulled out, and there was no legal obligation to go fix the canal up and pour it in again. So just like the navigation canals, it allowed storm surge, it allowed rising sea levels, to permeate into this delta that is no longer growing and no longer rising. This increased the amount of land water interfaces, it increased the erosive interface. The saltwater intrusion turned saline marshes into open water and freshwater swamps into saline marshes. The cypress trees died. Uh, and you start to see a wholesale transformation of the Delta A plain here. There's a number of other factors here. I'm just showing. Nutria here, which were introduced uh, from Argentina in the 1930s for fur bearing purposes. This is a, uh, the, the, uh, the muskrat trade here it was one of the coastal industries and quite sustainable. Uh, but then there was a change in fashion in the 1980s that uh, made fur coats unpopular. And the, pelt, the price for a pelt for a Nutria went from $11 to $1. It was no longer worth your time to go trap them. And so the population absolutely exploded. And now I'm not gonna blame coastal erosion on the nutria, but they exacerbated a bad situation. They do so, they have these protruding teeth that uh, pull up these delicate marsh grasses, cane break and things like that, exposing the thin soils and making them ever more vulnerable to, to wind and water uh, uh, erosion. So as a result of this, <clears throat> this sinkage, the subsidence uh, in the face of increasingly rising seas, four inches in the 20th century, you know the predictions now, 40 inches plus in the 21st century. And we have, um, I'm not gonna say a unique set of, set of circumstances, but a distinct one compared to other coastal cities. Other coastal cities are all dealing with the predictions of sea level rise, but what do you measure uh, elevation against, right? Our land surface is subsiding absolutely and even more relative to the rising sea at the same time that it's eroding laterally horizontal. So we have vertical droppage, horizontal erosion, the face of a rising sea. So all this translates that over the course of one human lifetime, the 1930s to the early 2000s, everything in red on this map has disappeared from southeastern Louisiana. The yellow is the human footprint. Uh, and every, this is the Delta A plain, not the top over here. So everything in this lower area to different degrees is, um, is sinking uh, vertically. And as you can see here, eroding uh, in, in, uh, with, with this interface to the sea. <clears throat> Sorry. The red here, we've lost about 2,000 square miles. We used to compare it to the state of Rhode Island. Now we compare it to the state of Delaware. Uh, and you're looking at about 40% of that loss here. If I extended this to 
South Central and Southwestern Louisiana, you would see the other 60%. Now for New Orleans proper, remember I mentioned the natural levee over here, uh, where most of the urban footprint today, this explains why when you drive around, you see most of the historic houses closest to the river. When you go closer to the lake, you see mostly 20th century architecture. What changed in between came during the progressive era, late uh, 1890s, early 1900s, which, you know, in, in not coincidentally coincided with the the age of heroic engineering and, and civil engineering, <clears throat> whereby this city, using local expertise, including Tulane-trained experts, installed uh, one of the arguably the world's greatest municipal drainage system. Uh, and Yaki mentioned yellow fever earlier. Um, the premier theory uh, explaining uh, arbovirus diseases, uh, dengue, malaria, yellow fever from 180 years ago was miasmatic theory. Miasmas was this perception of vaporous gases rising from hydric environments, wetlands, swamps, marshes, uh, and people believe that's where ma malaria comes from, mal area, bad air. And so people almost universally blame the swamp for this disease, uh, the real culprit, was Aedes aegypti. It was an invasive mosquito uh, that really didn't breed in the swamp. It bred in little water bodies, in mismanaged uh, urban water systems, in little puddles in people's backyards and in cisterns. Uh, nevertheless, the system was installed, and it's a system we have today. And it's an amazing system. I just took my students of a tour where we follow raindrops falling on Tulane's campus and we follow how it works its way into the canals, into the pumping systems, and getting uh, ejected into, into Lake Pontchartrain. It worked all too well. In a remarkably short amount of time, just over 100 years ago, the back swamp waters uh, were removed. Uh, then subsurface drainage apparatus was put in. That removed the soil water, and development followed right behind it. And everyone was in it, real estate interest, the city, the, any given citizen saw this as a good thing. Uh, and, uh, and so we have, uh, you saw in that earlier photo, urbanization now spreading toward the lake. All good, right? Successful cities grow and expand, except this is not a typical city geographically. Remember that deltaic plain and how the sediment got here. Water is an intrinsic part of the soil body. Sand, silt, clay, water, and organic matter. If you remove the water with this engineering system, that opens up cavities. That dryness allows the organic matter to oxidize, decay, shrink, and open up even more cavities. Now you've got a dried out sponge. So all of those fine particles start to settle, consolidate, and drop below sea level. You've probably heard New Orleans is partially below sea level, but you may not realize that this was an anthropogenic accident. Humans sunk everything in red below sea level. So if you have this now sinking series of polders and people moving into these lower spaces, and then you have an eroding coast surrounding it with rising water, all the more dependent you become on these levees to keep the latter from pouring into the, the in, into the former. And that is what failed 16 years ago in certain spots leading to the catastrophe of Katrina. So the question that you will encounter here, how and where, now the how part is the architects and the engineers, the where part is the geographer. Uh, can we sustainably uh, live here? Uh, and so you have all of these other professions <coughs> and disciplines, all of them, here, active here at Tulane, and I would argue even as, a, as an outsider here, that architects are the, the one profession slash discipline who draw from each of these other ones through collaborations, through mutual learnings, and what greater place to, to execute all of this here. <coughs> How do I know this? Well, because we have this 300 year legacy of design ideas coming from elsewhere and getting modified and tweaked and innovated and applied locally here. Um, and which brings me to my secular argument here. And this is particularly directed for those of you in preservation. We have this historical legacy of des design, diffusion, adaptation, 
and innovation. I'm using the word diffusion in the geographer sense of how ideas move, okay? A culture moves is immigration. The package of cultural baggage that comes with that movement of humanity and how ideas move across space. And once again, you're in uh, the ideal place to look at that. Uh, port cities are amazing phenomena, but what's, what's so distinct about this particular one is that we are at the nexus of arguably one of the, 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 the largest hinterlands ever to be accessed by one single port. New York has an amazing port, but its hinterland only goes to the mid-Atlantic states. Savannah, Mobile, they're regional hinterlands. Our hinterland covers a million square miles. I like to call it Alberta to Alabama and New York to New Mexico, okay? The entire uh, Miss, uh, Mississippi watershed, so much of it navigable uh, in what proved to be the, the wealthiest valley on earth. Uh, and so you have this gigantic foreland where you could get throughout the South Atlantic, the Caribbean, and to the rest of the world. So how could amazing things not happen at that nexus? Uh, and so architecturally, we could see this going back 250 to 300 years ago when design ideas and uh, uh, basic architectural styles and typologies started to arrive from Normandy and France, a little bit later from Spain, from West Africa, attenuated through the experience of the French and Spanish uh, in the Caribbean, particularly present-day Haiti, Saint-Domingue, uh, and we still retain some evidence of these uh, early 18th century French Creole uh, buildings that uh, can easily pass for what you might see uh, in, um, in places like the West Indies. The double pitch roof, the raised construction, the oversized roof. None of these ideas were here in the 1720s. What you would have seen here in the very earliest years is structures lifted right out of Normandy, France. The roof line came right to the walls. They weren't raised above the grade. There was brick between post-construction without any protection from the precipitation. It didn't work. And so what they did over the next 20 years or so is they were called house rights at the time, is incrementally start to experiment. Well, you know, if you raise it up, you, you reduce the risk of the water problem. If you make the roof larger, you have space for a gallery, which gives you protection from the elements. So the idea diffused from elsewhere, but the innovation and the adaptation came locally. And you see uh, similar with more Spanish buildings that came during the late uh, 18th century in the Spanish era. Here's another historic photo I wanna share with you. I first, it's a 1930s fo photo of a courtyard in the French Quarter. And it just blew me away when I first saw that. It's still standing today. It's on the corner of Royal and St. Anne that that's in the United States, that's right here locally. I mean, it looks like something out of Madrid or Rome or Havana. Now, after Louisiana Purchase, you have a whole different mass of humanity coming here. And they tend to come from uh, Ireland and England and Germany in particular, and from the Northeast. Uh, English speaking people start to bring, come down here. And once again, they bring their cultural baggage with them the English language, English common law, and they bring neoclassicism, something you really didn't see here. And so as Amer Anglo-Americans start to arrive here, you see the architectural thinking of the Enlightenment here. You see Greek revival, you see uh, Hellenism, uh, and uh, to the point that by the 1840s, 1850s, uh, that sort of allusions to Greek classicism becomes a little musty, uh, musty. it becomes, uh, it, it doesn't quite align with the times, the, romant the rise of the romanticism uh, encourages a more ebullient sort of the aesthetics of luxury. Uh, and they draw their inspiration not from ancient Greece, but from the medieval and Renaissance ruins outside of places like Rome and Italy. And it becomes known as Italian aid. And that diffuses across the Atlantic into the Northeast. I think the first one, uh, Italianate structures is in New Jersey in the 1830s. Those same architects moved down here, this being the largest city in the South. And in the 1850s through 1880s, you see explosion of Italianate, the segmented arches, the, the ornate gingerbread. Um, and going back to Richardson Memorial Hall, here's a story of 
a locally born architect, Henry H. Richardson, born uh, in St. Uh, uh, Charles Parish, goes to school at the predecessor of Tulane, which is called the University of Louisiana, then goes off to Harvard in the 1860s, does field work throughout France, is inspired by these late Roman buildings, these kind of solid, uh, uh, low profile, massive structures. If you're from Boston, you probably know his first commission, uh, Trinity Church, and that made him almost overnight the star architect of the nation. And Richardson Romanesque starts to sweep the nation. He only has one design here in New Orleans, but it didn't matter. He's a local architect who went elsewhere, became famous. The style diffused through thousands of architects practicing it and arrived back here in New Orleans. In fact, the president of Tulane, Preston Johnson, took a tour uh, in the 1880s and 1890s of Northeastern uh, universities to see what a campus ought to look like. And he came back with this notion that it ought to look like Richardson Romanesque, again, a, a local product. Now, it's pure coincidence that our building is named Richardson Memorial Hall. It's a different Richardson. But this became the signature style of, of most of our conic buildings, which gets us into the late Victorian era. And as much as any American city, this, this city just exploded in the high detail and exuberance uh, of that architectural era. Then diffusional patterns start to shift over to California, the arts and crafts movement. People start to see Lake Victorian as excessive, almost to the point of vulgar. And there's a movement to more, uh, more simple, natural look of arts and crafts. And the California bungalow coming out of Pasadena starts to come out of California. Also, California is, is rediscovering its own legacy in the form of mission style and Spanish revival. And we have tremendous manifestations of that. Uh, these look like pictures that could be in San Diego. 100% of them are, are in, in New Orleans. By the World War II era, actually 1920s and beyond, now architects are getting their cultural ideas in every, they, they're not coming from any particular predominant direction. Uh, and once again, despite the relatively small size of the city, we have great manifestations of that early modernism, of Art Deco, of modernized Gothic. Uh, and then a little later on, after World War II, of international capital M modernism. Uh, and Curtis and Davis here, the Lost Rivergate Exhibition Hall. They also designed uh, the Superdome and many other structures. And this city really embraced mid-century modernism in that era. Uh, changes came after this that we could go in another time. And postmodernism found an apt home here as well. Uh, and you're probably familiar, uh, familiar with the uh, Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia, which is often featured in, in architectural textbooks as kind of heralding in postmodernism. Into the modern era, and I'm showing one of the housing projects that uh, was recently demolished and rebuilt. I did a study a few years ago that showed, if you're wondering about post-Katrina residential uh, reconstruction, uh, that for better or worse, uh, stylistically, for every one contemporary or modern style residential structure built after Katrina, there were 14 that were neo-traditional uh, historical revival, whatever you might think of this stylistically. So all this to say that you have all of these storylines and manifestations here live and in the streetscape uh, in a way that you could really uh, manifest and, and have a sense of the history and the geography of this area. Uh, which leads me to my final point. Here you have an opportunity to empower vulnerable peoples and improve troubled places through design. Think of any problematic, any condition that you want to apply yourself to, you could find it here and you're needed here. And I'll wrap up there. Thank you.